okay um, i think uh, just i think we can start now um, so let me do a quick uh, recap of what we did in the last class so this is one example that we took uh, you know the uh, set of all second order polynomial and uh, i did a mistake in the last class how many of you recognize that i had emailed also right what is that so if you look at the following right so uh, let's say the set of all polynomial which is a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared such that a1 a2 a or a0 a1 a2 belongs to r is a vector space that is something that we uh, verified in the last class but then uh, we looked at the notion of uh, you know basis and so on and that's where we made a mistake right so uh, since uh, some of the people who were online uh, i couldn't uh, i mean they couldn't uh, uh, connect as a result of it they lost some part of the last lecture so maybe i'll do a quick recap so that they will also uh, understand what uh, certain notions that we discussed yesterday so what was the first uh, notion that we discussed yesterday what is the first thing that we did right after looking at uh, vector space we looked at what is known as linear independence right is that correct right so what do you mean by linear independence uh, so essentially the idea was this right so suppose i uh, take two vectors like this let's say v1 v2 right uh, these are linearly independent because um i cannot take a linear combination of the two and get zero right for, whereas for example if you take a vector like this right so v1 is this and uh, let's say v2 is this now i can take a linear combination of the two to get zero what is that you know take for example minus v1 that will be this direction right minus v1 uh so i have to add um v1 to it so v2 i can write it as what or v1 v2 i can write it as some alpha times v1 of course in this case alpha is less than 1 you are shrinking the vector so now uh, all that i have to do is v1 minus alpha uh, or let's say v2 minus alpha v1 is 0 right that means 1 times v1 plus minus alpha times sorry 1 times v2 plus minus alpha times v1 is 0 so some linear combination is 0 right that's what linear independence is right so how do you define that we say that v1 v2 etc vm belonging to v or linearly independent if you take any linear combination right if summation i equal to 1 to m alpha i vi equal to 0 suppose i say that some linear combination of these equal to 0 that implies alpha i equal to 0 for all i right i mean the only possibility is all the coefficients being 0 otherwise you cannot have this right this is linear independence what is the next thing that we looked at span right what is span so uh, we looked at this example right so what is the span of uh, this vector v you take all possible linear combination of this vector what do you get you scale it by some positive constant then you get all the points in this direction right till infinity if you scale it by negative you'll get all the points in the negative direction so essentially you get a line passing through the origin right that's the span right for example if you take this what is the span of this you take any point in r2 i can write it as a linear combination of this in some sense it you know i'll get the entire r2 right if i take for example v1 v2 v3 what will be the span same thing r2 right so uh, what is the span so we'll define a uh, span of uh, some vectors so span of v1 v2 etc vm so these vectors v1 through vm need not be linearly independent okay let me just check okay need not be linearly independent regardless of uh, uh, what kind of vectors you pick span is defined so what is span it is all possible linear combinations i equal to 1 to m alpha i vi 
such that all phi belongs to R. You pick any set of m numbers, take the linear combination, you get a vector. Keep on doing that uh, until whatever you exhaust every every possible combination. Right, so that will give me the span. Is this fine? Now with this, we define what is known as basis, right? So what is basis? So the idea is I have to write a given vector as a linear combination of uh, some set of fixed vector, right? That was the idea. Uh, we started with that. So you take, uh, let's say, n vectors. Okay, so let v1 v2 etc vn belong to v okay we uh, or okay we say that v1 v2 etc vn forms a basis of v if what are the two uh, two conditions what are the things that you need in order for this to be a basis what is the first thing? Louder. It should span the entire vector space. In other words, you look at the span or all possible linear combinations, it should be the entire V, right? And what else? Of course, in uh, R2, in a, on a plane, I can take 100 vectors. Okay, pointing different direction, it will span the entire R2, right? There is no big deal. But we cannot say that those 100 vectors form a basis, right? So only two vectors can form a basis. So what do you mean by that? So V1 through Vn are what? Linearly independent, right? So this is fine. This is what we did in the last class, and uh, we saw that uh, the set of bases need not be unique, but this number n called the dimension should be unique. Okay, so uh, let's maybe um, revisit that today. Okay, so um, I'll di start with the definition. Okay, uh, let v1, v2, etc., vn be a basis for v, then the dimension of v, v is n. Okay, so this is the definition. So now um, I need to prove that this number n is unique, right? So I cannot have uh, two sets of vectors. One, uh, let's say, one is there are n vectors, the other one m vectors, such that both uh, form a basis, right? It's not possible. So towards that, we need what is known as uh, replacement lemma. So what is replacement lemma? I won't, uh, you know, formally write it as a theorem and so on. I'll give you the proof. Uh, you can uh, read it anywhere. Okay, so let's look at what is known as a replacement lemma. Okay, so the idea is this suppose I have uh, this set of vectors Vn, okay, be a basis, okay, a vector, you have a basis vector, okay. Uh, that means I give me any vector V, uh, basis vector of. V. Uh, let's say vector space v. Now we take any vector v in v. I can write it as a linear combination of v1 through vn, right? That's the definition. Now, uh, is it possible to replace v1 through vn by some vector v? That's the question, right? So can we replace? Uh, I'll take off one vector v1 and replace it with v, and still I should be able to manage to get the entire uh, whatever vector space, right? Uh, is it possible? So let's see. Okay, so let let's take a vector, some vector v belonging to v, v not equal to zero. Okay, so suppose I take a non-zero vector. So what is the first thing that you can uh, do? So I can write v as linear combinations of bases. Do you agree? Is this clear? I take a non-zero vector, I can always write. Okay. Well, even zero vector trivially I can write, but this is non-zero. Okay. So I can also assume that without loss of generality, alpha one is not zero, right? Uh, suppose uh, then you may argue that v can be v two itself. Then alpha one should be zero. Alpha two should be one, right? But then I can rearrange or re-index and make sure that um, the first v one is the vector, right? So without loss of generality, 
let alpha 1 not equal to 0 okay is this clear now uh, what i will do is uh, let's see what happens to let's check let's check what kind of kind of vectors let's say v v2 and so on vn are uh, what kind of vectors meaning are they linearly independent will it span all these questions right so what do you think so do you think these are linearly independent do you think these are linearly independent yes or no remember this is very crucial okay so this alpha 1 is not 0 okay fine so now what can you say so can you claim that these are linearly independent huh no or yes or no huh so pictorially let's look at so for example you have let's say v1 and this is v2 of course this form these two vectors form a basis for r2 right do you agree so now i'm going to give another vector okay so uh, maybe this is my vector v definitely alpha 1 is uh, maybe i should write it the other way okay so write it as v2 and v1 so of course um, i should walk some non zero distance along v1 and some non zero distance along v2 to get to v right therefore alpha 1 is not zero in this case right now naturally i can replace this guy by this guy right so i can take v1 and v v2 and v as my new basis right without any problem do you agree with this so you cannot do that provided this v aligns with this or this okay then only we cannot do otherwise we can right do you agree that's what it says so i'm going to replace with such a vector with the first one v1 okay so um, the claim is or intuition or uh, the picture says that this particular thing is also a linearly independent and it spans uh, the entire vector space in other words they form a basis okay so how do you prove this proof is kind of interesting okay so uh, uh, maybe in the core of data analysis or machine learning you don't need this but uh, it's a cool trick which uh, which is useful in general let's look at that so what is it that I have to prove uh, i have to prove that this vector v v2 v3 and so on vn form a basis first of all let's prove that it's linearly independent so what do, what is it that i have to do so if i have to prove that need to prove need to show that if i take linear combination of these vectors and equate it to zero then the coefficient should be zero that's what you mean by linearly independent right so alpha um let's look at this okay so maybe i'll use a different uh, beta 1 times v plus beta 2 times v2 plus beta 3 times v3 and so on right so i'll write it in short form so this is i equal to 2 to n beta i vi equal to 0 implies beta i equal to 0 for all i this is what we need to show right so how do you show this any idea but what is v what is this guy v is such a vector that i can write it as a linear combination of v1 through vn because v1 through vn form a basis so i can write that right so i equal to 1 to n alpha i vi okay so let's say some coefficients alpha i remember alpha 1 is not equal to 0 that is crucial okay so now if i plug that in what do i get i get beta 1 so uh, let me write it like this so I'll say i equal to, let me start with 2, okay, 2 to n, okay, uh, alpha i vi comes from here and there is a beta 1, right, so beta 1 alpha i vi, okay, this is fine, then i equal to 2 to n beta i vi, that comes from this, plus, I have to write the first term, what is the first term, beta 1, alpha 1 v1 right equal to 0 so well if it is equal to 0 what does that imply that implies well let me write it like this beta 1 alpha 1 
v1 plus summation i equal to 2 to n beta 1 alpha i vi equal to 0. Right? So now what can you argue out now? So can somebody argue out beyond this? What is it that you will get? Yes. What can you say from this equation? Hmm? Can somebody tell me? If you don't speak, then even I'll get bored, right? Can somebody speak online? So they are linearly independent. What are linearly independent? No, no. Sorry. The vectors v1 to no, if, if sorry, sorry, that's wrong. That's wrong. No, you are right. V1 through Vn are linearly independent because it forms a basis, right? Yeah, they are the basis. Ah, so what can you say about this equation? It's a linear combination of V1 through Vn. So that means what? All the coefficients should be zero, right? So this implies, okay, let me write it here. So this should be equal to zero. These should be equal to zero, right? Do you agree? Hmm? Right? So uh, uh, did I make any mistake? V1 and this is, yeah. So uh, did I make a mistake? So this is not, uh, uh, oh, I mean, oh my God. So this is not correct, right? So what is this? Did I make a mistake here? So there are two terms, right? Beta 1 alpha i plus beta i times vi. Okay. So this is a mistake, right? Algebraic mistake. So I have to add this to beta i because vi's are common, right? Is that clear? Fine. So this is also zero. So what, what does this imply? So of course, beta 1 times alpha 1 is zero. But what can you say about alpha 1? Alpha 1 cannot be zero. zero, right? Therefore, what can you say from this? This you can say beta 1 is 0. Do you agree? So if beta 1 is 0, uh, of course, uh, all these terms will be 0, right? Do you agree? So now, beta 1 alpha i plus beta i. Beta 1 alpha i plus beta i is 0. But beta 1 is 0 which implies beta i is 0 for all i, right? So that's what we wanted, right? Beta 1 is 0, beta i is 0 for all i greater than or equal to 2. Well, uh, the previous one says that it should be greater than or equal to 1 also because beta 1 is also 0. That means they are linearly independent. Is this clear? Okay. Okay. So I, I don't bore you too much with the other proof. So the second claim is we you should check this whether this is true or not. V2 to Vn span V. Okay, you check this. Okay, I won't, uh, uh, I won't uh, help you in this. So you just figure out uh, how to prove this. Is that fine? So that means if I have a basis, if you have a vector V not equal to zero, I can replace one of them by that vector. Okay, that's what it says, right? Now, uh, let's go back to what we did in the last class, right? So we took, we had to prove that the dimension is unique, right? So you cannot have dimensions being different for the same space, right? So how do you prove that? Uh, you take two bases, let's say V1, V2, etc., Vn. And similarly, you take U1, U2, etc., Um, M greater than uh, N, okay? This is the case. Both are bases, okay? So what do you mean? How do you use the replacement lemma, the previous argument? What do you do? What should I replace this with? Huh? Right? It says I can replace one of the vector by the other and still maintain the basis. So now, um, how do you prove that you cannot have m not equal to n, right? So what do you do? I mean, I'll just show pictorially. First thing is I can take u1 and replace with one of them, right? I can put u1 in one of them and replace knock off some vi, okay? Take u2 and knock off something here, right? 
keep on doing that until un right so you knock off so what will happen you would have knocked off everything here and replaced with n vectors in among m vectors okay so but uh, now see what the previous theorem says it says even if you replace it still obeys the property of linear sorry basis right linear independence and span but now you have taken a smaller subset of a basis and you are claiming it's a basis which is a contradiction right so you cannot have that so that means the only possibility is you should have exhausted everything that means m equal to n okay so is this uh, clear any questions okay fine everything fine okay so now you know what uh, basis is you know what linear independence all those right so now we can look at one very quick example of uh, you know data analysis which is like almost trivial example right so what is the trivial example uh, let's say um, in data analysis what happens is let's say you are looking at um, something like this let's say you are looking at some price versus some uh, parameters okay so maybe i'll look at uh, let's say this is x this is y and this is price okay now uh, what do i do i go to the um, let's say the real world i collect the data and i see what the prices are and i keep plotting this right so whatever you get some plot like this right so typically you know this can be modeled by a straight line okay so i have to fit this using a straight line okay um what does this boil down to so essentially it will boil down to a uh, Where, you know uh, something of this form okay so I, you need to solve this kind of equations do you agree i don't think i need to motivate this y equal to x have you seen this kind of equations obviously right a is let's say n cross n x is n cross 1 let's say i'll use small letter here okay y is n cross 1 right i want to solve for x solve for x so how do you solve for x what do you do yes what is it that you will do how do you solve for x huh can can you tell me yes 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 what's your name ananya okay So can you tell me? Huh? I didn't. Can you shout? Sure. Yeah. No, there is nothing here. So uh, I haven't given you any explicit problem. I'm saying y equal to a x, right? A is a matrix. X is a vector. Uh, you are supposed to find what x is, right? I have given you y and I have given you a. So what is it that you will do? A inverse. Yeah, you have to find what is called the inverse, right? So, what is this A doing? It takes a vector and spits out another vector, right? It's like a transformation. It tells you how to map a vector to a vector, right? You take a vector in R n, maps it to R n, right? That's all it's doing, right? So, uh, you know, this is what you have, right? So, you have A, which is mapping R n to R n. well why should one consider such uh, transformation i can also consider a matrix which is let's say n cross m what do you get if it is n cross m it takes a vector in rm right maps it to rn right so in other words uh, how do you generalize this this is what you have been look you know uh, seeing since uh, high school or maybe uh, puc right pre university uh, but can we generalize this what is this saying this is saying how to map a vector to another vector right so how do you generalize what what can you say about this r let's say rm what can you say about this what can you say about this this is a vector space right what is the dimension of this vector space m okay This is a vector space. Let me call it as V. What can you say about this? 
this is another vector space let me call it as w so essentially this this particular matrix a is saying how to map a vector in rm to a vector in rn or a vector in v to vector in w right well i can generalize this right so i can always say instead of uh, writing a i'll just write uh, a transformation okay it, it is a rule or a map right which maps a ve vector in vector space v to a vector in vector space w right okay so now uh, what can you say about rm and rn suppose i have rm and i also have rn so what can you say about uh, these two relationship wise suppose m is 3 and n is 4 what can you say let's say r2 versus r3 what what is the relationship between the two what is the relationship r2 is like all the vectors on a big plane right r3 is what the entire universe right so whatever three dimensional right so now what is the relationship between the two see this is a plane i mean uh, r2 is basically a plane in fact what we observe is a vertical plane right of infinite uh, size right and you have three dimension and it passes through the origin okay and you have three dimension which is like the entire space so what is the relationship between the two ha huh? subset r r2 lies in r3 right do you agree so uh, r2 itself is a vector space right which sits inside r3 so what is the name that i should give subspace right r2 is a subspace of r3 okay so how do you define that okay so now let me write that as a definition let v and w b two vector spaces okay we say that w is a subspace of v if couple of things uh, if you say w is a subspace w should be sitting inside v w is containing v what is the next thing w is a vector space okay it's over the same field r okay so or same field f it should be uh, i mean i should be using only real numbers on both in on both are, are complex right okay so now this is obvious right so this is how one can define so uh, if i have to show that uh, something is a subspace of another first thing that i have to show is one is contained in the other and the second thing is it's a vector space right is there a simpler way i mean do we need to show all the properties of a vector space suppose i know that this is true w sits inside v should you show that you know if i want to show that w is a vector space now um one way is you list out all the properties and verify all the properties right it takes time is there a simpler way remember w sits inside v so if you take two vectors in w and add them it cannot go out of v right it should be there in v at least right but if you ensure that it's there in w itself then we are done right so we can say that you take any two vectors in w let u v belongs to w okay and alpha 1 alpha 2 belongs to r you take two numbers then if the, if i take linear combination right alpha 1 u plus alpha 2 v belongs to w okay if i'll say if then we say that w is a subspace of v okay so i'll write this it's a subspace of v i mean it's a subset of v so first of all you have to take a w sitting inside v now i have to check whether w is a vector space or not all that i have to do is if i take any two vectors and linear combination within w it should be there in w that's all the rest assured right all the other properties will satisfy simply because of the fact that w sits inside v okay is that fine any questions fine right yes 
No, there is no guarantee that W is a vector space, right? See, what I'm doing is I have a vector space V. V is a vector space. I'm taking a subset W. Now, what will ensure that W is also a vector space? Therefore, it's a subspace, right? One condition that satis that will ensure that W is a vector space is this. No, 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 no. No, okay, so let me write it one by one. V is a vector space, okay? Somebody has given me a vector space, okay? Second, W is a subset of V. That's also given. Now you ask the question, is W a vector space? The answer is given by take any V U in W, alpha beta in r then alpha v plus beta u belongs to w this is enough right if this is satisfied then w is a vector space therefore w is a subspace you understood what a subspace is right clear okay so uh, can you give an example of a subspace uh, apart from trivial one like R3 is a subspace of R4 and R4 is a subspace of R100 and so on. Any other uh, example? Okay, so let's go back to what we did yesterday, right? So uh, one example that we took yesterday was uh, this polynomial, right? Huh. This is a vector space. Do you agree? Okay. Now, what is the basis of this? Hmm? 1 x x squared. These are basis, right? Because I can get any polynomial by linear combination of these three. And these are linearly independent. So, what is the dimension of this vector space? Huh? Is 3, right? Because only 3 vectors suffice. Clear? Now, what is the subspace of this? Any idea? What is the subspace? Let me call this as P1, which is alpha naught plus alpha 1 x such that alpha naught alpha 1 belong to R. This is a subspace, right? Do you agree? Because I'll pick A2 to be equal to 0 in the previous, I'll get all this. So it's a subset. Now, how do I prove that it's a subspace? Well, you take any two combinations of these. Uh, first order polynomial, I will get another first order polynomial, right? I cannot get second, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, second degree polynomial, not R, right? So it has to be a subspace. Is that fine? Clear? Okay. So this is a mistake that we did, right? So I tried to give a fancy, you know, uh, example of, uh, you know, the coefficients being rational and all that. No, I mean, this is a simple one. Uh, we need not worry too much about this, okay? So now, um, of course, um, we have the notion of subspace and we have, we will just looked at what is a transformation or a map, right? A matrix is a simple transformation. So you can have any other transformations. So now let's look at what are the possible uh, properties of a matrix transformation, okay? So let's take a map, which is from, let's say, Rn, M to Rn. This is a matrix, okay? Now, what can you say about this uh, transformation? First thing is, if I take two vectors, right? Let's say I take u and v in this vector space, a right? two m-dimensional vector. What can you say about a times u plus v? Of course, it's in Rn, that's for sure, because u plus v is in Rm. Rm is a vector space. If I operate here, by definition, it goes to Rn. But I can write this, right? Why is this true? Uh, well, exercise. Uh, take an M cross N matrix, uh, you know, X plus Y, A X plus A times X plus Y is A X plus A Y. That's very clear. Okay. 
Now, this also belongs to Rn because by definition of A. So, what is this property called? Okay, now let's say I take uh, u multiply by a number alpha. Okay, so I'm going to scale it by alpha and operate A. What do I get? Right? It's like operating A on u and then scaling it by alpha, right? This is also very straightforward. So if you can you recall some uh, some name for this? What is this called? Huh? What is this called? Any idea? Huh? What is this called? No idea? Hey, you should have learned this in. How many of you are in, uh, most of you are in third year, right? So you have taken control systems, at least electrical engineers, signal systems. Okay, now you should tell me, at least electrical engineering students should tell me uh, the answer. What is this called? I can't hear you. Linearity, right? It's called linear. Okay. It's called linear system or it's a linear transformation, right? So how do I generalize this? So you take any T that maps a vector space V to a vector space W. How do I uh, define linearity? Same old stuff, right? So what do I do? I take UV in V and take alpha in R. Let's assume that these vector spaces are defined over R, right? Now, all that I have to do is, uh, well, uh, u plus v is du plus dv. And transformation of alpha u is alpha times transformation of v. This is how we define linearity, right? All right? OK. So now, uh, it doesn't matter. Now, I can sort of mimic matrices by using transformations. So why do you need transformation if you have matrices? The answer is, uh, I mean, why do you need to have linear transformations if you have matrices? Well, matrix is one aspect, right? So for example, if you are dealing with R and RM, fine. But what if you are dealing with uh, something else, some strange vector spaces, right? For example, set of all continuous functions from uh, 0, 1 to 0, 1, right? That forms a vector space. So uh, what is the guarantee, right? Uh, so how do you how do you deal with transformations there? So what is a transformation there? Can somebody tell me? Suppose I say uh, v is set of all 0, 1 to 0, 1, okay? Um, such that let me also make one more simplifying assumption equal to 0. So how does this functions look like? Let's say this is 1 and this is 1. It's like all sort of functions like this. Uh, all kinds of functions, right? Right? All kinds of uh, functions like this. Well, um, it's 0, 1, right? So is this correct? No. Why? Negative. I mean, that's an issue, right? It cannot be negative. So let me redraw this. It'll be like this, right? 1. 1, okay. assume that its peak is 1, all kinds of functions like this, right? Each function is a point in the set, right? So you have uncountably many functions which I collect in a basket called V and this is a vector space, we saw that, right? Now what is the transformation here? Any idea? Weird, right? So what do you mean by a transformation of this? What should what what is a transformation, for example, from V to V here? Can you give me an example of a transformation? Just to you know, I'm giving these examples just to make things clear. Okay, so vector space means not just Rn. There are other examples, and it will be useful in general. Okay, even in machine learning or, or data analysis. What is a transformation? In the usual stuff, matrix, it takes a vector and gives you a vector, right? Here, what should it take and what should it give? You should take a function. It should give you another function. 
right? Can you give me an example of such a transformation? It takes function as input and functions as output. I think electrical engineering students should be able to give it. I think even uh, mechanical, right? So you would have seen so many. Huh? What is that? Okay, so let me give you an example, right? You you take a function f of x. I will integrate dx from 0 to 1 because f of x is defined from 0 to 1, right? This is a transformation, right? Why? This is some other function. Let me call it as psi of y, right? Because for each y, you'll get a number. So it's psi of y. One thing is this y should be in 0, 1. Is that good enough? No. Why? Because I want this also, right? So I should ensure that psi of 0 is 0 and psi of 1 is 1, uh, 0 again, right? I should choose such a function g of x, y. Then it's a valid transformation, fine? Okay? Is this okay? Uh, now the question is, uh, you know, can it be linear, right? So let's not go deep into this, okay? So uh, we can come up with an example where t is linear even here. So now, uh, what is importance? What is the importance of this, uh, you know, uh, vector space business or linear algebra? You unify things, right? Uh, on the one hand, you can look at vectors, discrete. On the other hand, you can look at integral equations and so on. All these things can be solved in one umbrella, right? One textbook will kind of solve many of these problems, right? Okay. So now we have uh, the notion of transformations, and we have the notion of linear transformations. Right so now, let's go back to this question of when can you uh, invert, right? So, uh, but what do you mean by inversion? Inversion. So, for example, I have a vector. Let's say mapping from let's say v to v itself. Okay, for simplicity. So, what do you mean by uh, invert? So, a transformation being invertible. Of course, linear transformation from now onwards. I won't look at non-linear transformations. So, what do you mean by invertible? Can somebody tell me? What do you mean by invertible? So it essentially means this. So suppose I write it pictorially. Suppose this is my V and V. Suppose I give you a vector here or a point here. So I should be able to map to a unique point here. Do you agree? That means a point in the range. So this is called range. What is this called? Huh? Domain, right? Yes. So now I give me any point in the range, I should be able to find a unique point in the domain, right? That's one thing. Is it good enough? Suppose I give you a point here, nothing gets mapped to this. Then also it's a problem, right? I don't know how to invert that because nothing gets mapped to. So in other words, the range should be the entire vector space. These are the two things. What are these? There are names for these things, right? No big deal. I mean, intuitive. If you, uh, let's say, if you had born in, the, you know, some 1300 AD or something, maybe or you would have this invented the same thing, right? Uh, what is the name? A unique point in the range maps to a unique point in the domain. What is that called? 1, 1, right? Okay. What is the other thing called? You should map to the entire range. If I, right? There is another name also. Do you know? Huh? Okay. Subjective. Injective, right? Subjective and injective implies what? Bijective, right? Uh, on two and one one implies it's invertible. Okay. Is this fine? Everybody knows this, right? Okay, now we need to ask this question, right? So when is this linear transformation invertible? Okay, so let's ask the reverse question, okay? So when can we have this kind of a situation, right? We are at a situation, so. Now, I take a point here, but this point gets mapped by this as well as this. So this is something that we should avoid, right? Let me call this vector V and this is uh, U, okay? So V and U are different. So that means V is not equal to U, right? I should avoid this point, uh, this, this situation. So let's look at what is the condition. So T operate on U, you get, let me call this as W, okay, this vector. 
i get w if i operate v i still get w right so that means tu is same as tv right what does that imply that implies t is or i'll take it to the other side right tu minus tv is zero right so this is same as i'm going to write every step but just to make sure that you know minus v is zero right i'm using invoking linearity here okay so be very careful so t u minus v is zero right what can you say about u minus v see u and v are not the same vector so u minus v cannot be zero right this is not equal to zero you agree so that means you will have this situation this kind of a bad situation if there is a vector when you map it you get zero right right do you agree so we need to avoid what i mean if t has to be invertible the first thing that you need is it should not map a non zero vector to zero right so let me write that t should not map a non zero vector to a zero vector that's the first thing that you need right if this happens then you are done so it cannot be invertible right so of course you should map the entire range that's another thing right so every you take any point there should be a point here right so i mean you should be cover the entire range that's the next thing okay now let's see what are the implications of this alone for a matrix so what can you say about the matrix suppose consider a matrix a well typically we write it this way right i think you might have seen this what is this matrix of dimension n cross n okay so if it is an n cross n so i take set of all n cross n matrices is this a vector space yes so what is the dimension of that what is the dimension of set of all n cross n matrices definitely it's a vector space because we verified it for 2 cross 2 okay think of 2 cross 2 so what do you mean what is the dimension of that can you give me an example of a basis there yes ha huh? 4 yeah 1000001000 and 0010001 right this will be your basis right there are many other basis that you can come up with okay so that means if you have an n cross n matrix matrix or set of all n cross n matrices what is the dimension of that n square okay fine you take a matrix and now a inverse i'll write this as a inverse okay this is invertible right does not exist if there exist a vector v not equal to 0 such that a v is 0 right this is what it says okay so what is the implication of this i mean let's this is very practical okay so uh, even in data analysis uh, we want certain matrices to be invertible um, so we need to know what does that mean right so let's write this okay so let's take an example okay so let's say i have a uh, 2 cross 2 matrix okay a1 a2 Uh, i think uh, i'll write it like this a1 a2 b1 b2 okay so this is my 2 cross 2 matrix and let's say v is like let's say xy okay equal to 0 what does this mean i can write it like this right so uh, a1 x plus well uh, this is i'm little embarrassed to write these things it's like so so basic but anyway you should not forget what this implies i can write this in a slightly different fashion right so what is that see i can combine these two and combine these two and add them right so what does that mean i can write a1 a2 i'll multiply it by by x right plus y times b1 b2 this is 0 0 do you agree with that right so essentially i am taking linear combinations of columns 
to get zero, right? That's what it implies. What are the what are the coefficients? X and y, right? Remember, x y both cannot be zero, right? One of them is one of them can be zero at most. Both cannot be zero. So now, what is the implication of this? Okay, let's uh, let's look at this. So it says x times a vector, the first column plus y times the second column is zero. That means x times the first column is negative y times the second column or first column is some scaled constant of the second column. What does that mean? If I think of first column as a vector, the second column is some scaled version. Okay, uh, sorry. If this is like this, this will be scaled version or whatever in the reverse direction. What does that mean? What can you say about these two vectors? Linearly dependent, right? So um, yeah, so it's linearly dependent. Therefore, you cannot invert. That is one thing, right? So we cannot, A inverse does not exist if this happens. This happens, what does that mean? That's equivalent to the columns are linearly dependent. So you should always ensure that the columns are linearly independent. That's one thing. What about uh, rows? Hmm? What can you say about the rows? So let me make that first observation, OK? So A inverse does not exist. If columns of A columns of A are linearly dependent. Okay, one thing. Okay, so for n cross n matrix, the column, so each vector is of size n, right? So you have n vectors, so they have to be linearly independent. So if they are linearly independent, it spans Rn. So it should form a basis. Essentially, if you have an n cross n matrix, if you look at the columns, columns should form a basis for Rn, right? Otherwise, there is no way by which you can invert, it, right? We will see. You know, if you cannot invert, what else can be done is something that we'll study a little later. But this is one guaranteed thing. Okay. So what about A transpose? I mean, what about uh, the rows? Huh? What can you say about the rows? Rows are also vectors, right? Do you agree? Now, uh, what can you say about rows? Hmm? One way to look at this is if A inverse exists, right? The inverse of that should also exist, right? So you have to come back, right? Uh, so that means, a inverse inverse should exist, right? Which is A, basically. So now if I apply the same argument to A inverse, what, what do you get? Nothing, right? That doesn't help you whether to, you know, what happens to the rows? So now what should I do for rows? How do you convert uh, columns to rows and rows to columns? Ah, so I should look at A transpose, right? Now, if A inverse exists, A transpose inverse exists, we don't know, right? So, in other words, we need to see what is the meaning of this, right? What is the meaning of A transpose? Well, uh, meaning, meaning, uh, you know, uh, not just making rows to uh, column and columns to rows. What is the deeper meaning of A transpose? What does it mean, right? What, what kind of transformation is it? Right? That is something that we will uh, have to address. But for today, I would maybe we'll uh, look at this a little later. Okay. So it turns out that if the columns are linearly independent, n cross n matrix, then the rows will also be linearly independent. So um, this leads to a definition. Okay. Let I'll restrict to n cross n. Uh, one can generalize it to any matrix. Let A belong to a is an n cross n matrix. The rank of A is defined as the number of linearly independent columns, okay, uh, which is equal to linearly independent rows. But uh, I'll just stop here because I haven't shown you why the column, the row should also be 
uh, linearly independent okay so now if a inverse exists then what can you say about the rank yes so a inverse does not exist if columns are linearly dependent so if a inverse exists then definitely it should be linearly independent right what does that mean that means the rank should be n right so that's for sure okay what about the opposite now the question would be if rank of a is n implies a inverse exists remember uh, you know uh, in the first class uh, we looked at a problem right what was that movie rating right missing entry so there we wanted to minimize the rank you know what rank is right the number of linearly independent uh, columns so we wanted to minimize that subject to some constraints now this is another question that we should uh, uh, address uh, going forward right so if i address some of these then i know when is uh, when a matrix is invertible okay now uh, the moment i say you know a matrix is invertible then the next question is how do you invert right of course as engineers we need to know we need to write a program that will invert the matrix we should see how to do that that's the next question right so what else uh, what are the other questions that uh, we as engineers will be interested in okay so i'll probably spend 2 3 minutes on that and then i'll stop so suppose i have this kind of uh, equation this is you know there everywhere right a linear equation so now uh, if i want to solve this one way is you know if a inverse exists x a is done right if i know how to find the inverse you are done are there any other ways of uh, doing this okay suppose uh, i'll uh, suppose a is diagonal what can you say suppose a is like this okay 0 0 this means except the diagonal everything else is zero so times x is y so what can you say about this kind of equation this is simple right so lambda 1 x1 is y1 lambda 2 x2 is y2 and so on lambda n xn is y n how easy is that right i can find x1 as y1 by lambda 1 x2 as y2 by lambda 2 you don't need to do anything fancy right straight forward so now if the matrix is diagonal i'm done right that's the best case scenario now is there a way to see i know how to multiply matrices multiplication of matrices is easy right and uh, even on hardware you can uh, build efficient hardware to do the multiplication of matrices right so that's why you don't use for loop in matlab or any other program that's why you use matrix multiplication because there are efficient implementation of that so now um, how do you convert a matrix into a diagonal suppose i say that i can write this as u a diagonal matrix u transpose okay what kind of this matrix is u let's say u u transpose is u transpose u is identity i'll come back to this again uh, soon suppose this is the case let's revisit this uh, ax equal to y so what is a u lambda u transpose x is y right what do i do i multiply by u transpose on the left on both sides okay so what can you say about this i okay i will call this as x tilde okay i'll call this as y tilde so what kind of equation i get lambda times x tilde is y tilde right see y tilde is easy to compute because i'm multiplying a matrix by a vector that's all right so so simple and uh, this is the equation now you know how to solve for x tilde x tilde is easy right easy to compute why because lambda is diagonal okay so i think i didn't say that right lambda is diagonal there is another class now okay yeah so now the moment i compute x tilde how do i find uh, x so u transpose x is x tilde right what is x i'll multiply by u on both sides so i get u u transpose is identity so i get all that i have to do is multiply right so that's why 
we need to ask this question when can i write this then my life will be very easy so that's the another big question that we will ask in this particular course a part of this course okay with this i'll stop uh, we will meet uh, in the next class